Let's talk about speed limits. Not the highway kind, more nature's kind, like the speed of my voice as it passes through the air between your speakers and your ears. The speed limit of sound, some 343 meters per second in room temperature air, comes down to the displacement of one material body by another. See, the propagating sound wave has to physically rearrange the air in front of you in order to be heard, which is why the vacuum is silent and why sound travels nearly three times faster through water than it does through air. But what about light? It has a speed limit too, but in the rarefied environment of the vacuum, light speed is at its maximum, not its minimum. What gives? Most scientists explain the light speed, sound speed discrepancies by saying that light waves aren't mechanical in nature, that they're pure energy. But at the material world, we interpret the data differently. Our analysis suggests that light speed does depend on the elastic deformation of a medium, just not exactly the medium that you're used to thinking about. This is episode two of our foundation series for the material world. If you want to know the philosophical foundation for all the work that we're doing here, check out episode one. If you want to know how light, gravity, and electromagnetism work, subscribe for future videos. Right now though, there is just one big question. Why is light speed limited? To understand why light speed is limited, we've got to start by asking, how stiff is space-time? It'd be nice if we could sit down with our good friend Albert and get some insight on the matter, but that's not in the cards. Luckily, we can get his perspective on the elastic modulus of space-time by translating the general theory of relativity into the physical language of a material-based science, specifically into Hooke's law. Hooke was a 17th century polymath who studied the dynamics of a basic spring scale and realized that it was possible to derive the stiffness of a material, K, by measuring the amount of deformation, X, that resulted from an applied force, F. It so happens that this Hookean relationship can also be found in Einstein's field equations, as long as you know where to look. Space-time tells matter how to move, and matter tells space-time how to curve. Deformation of space-time is therefore determined by the force of matter and energy. So when we rearrange the field equations appropriately, we can see the parallels. From a Hookean perspective, the deformation of space-time is analogous to the deformation of a spring. And the momentum of the materials involved is analogous to the force that causes that deformation. What's left in the Einstein field equation then is the gravitational constant, which turns out to be analogous to K, the stiffness of the material that's being deformed. This measure of space-time stiffness, which isn't an exact equivalence since materials are 3D and space-time is 4D, is extremely high, meaning that if there is a material between atoms, it's unbelievably stiff. Part one of the foundation series, linked here, explains why we can't treat space-time as a traditional material. But this calculation holds because the gravitational constant still tells us something about reality. It takes a lot of effort to deform space-time, even a little bit. Others who have asked the same question about the stiffness of space-time, like Princeton University's Kirk McDonald, have arrived at the answer in a slightly different way, but the figures still correlate. McDonald suggests the stiffness range based on classical mechanics, quantum mechanics, and electromagnetics from 10 to the 20th to 10 to the 113th pascals. His paper is linked in the description. Intuitively, a fantastically stiff substance described by space-time makes sense since it must be strong enough to structurally support enormous entities like the Earth, Sun, and all the other astronomical marvels. And knowing this, we can make our way back to the original question. Why does light have a speed limit? And why does it go faster in the vacuum? The answer has to do with what we talked about in our video on gravity with the inverse square law. If an atom's electron shell extends indefinitely, as suggested by the probability density function for the electron, then these same filaments that are responsible for gravity can also host a light. Sorry, Doc, I'm gonna have to stop you right there. Scientists already proved that light is simply a self-propagating electromagnetic field. That's quite interesting. Can you tell me more about how that works? Well, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter? Fields work. Scientists make extremely accurate predictions based on fields, so we know that's how Mother Nature does it. Hmm. 
But we went over this last time, Average Joe. Fields are effects that show the intensity of some process at a given point in space. There are wind fields, temperature fields, gravitational fields, EM fields. The fields tell us how much, but they can never tell us anything about the process that's actually happening underneath. Well, that's not what it says in the textbook. What are you, some kind of misinformation spreader or something? Look, that would mean a lot more if the textbook didn't still use the thoroughly discredited Bohr model of the atom. What kind of voodoo holds the little electron planet to the nucleus? What we're proposing at the material world is that light is the deformation of a really stiff substance that's stretched between atoms. When scientists talk about self-propagating electromagnetic fields and light, they're just talking about the intensity of that deformation and the concept of space-time agrees. Under this model, light speed is limited because the deformation of the material takes time. It's fastest in the vacuum then because the atoms are nodes in this space-time material and they delay, relay, or interfere with the transmission of light impulses. I know what you're thinking at this point. How can space be full of electron filaments? Space is space, it's empty. But here at the material world, we have a slightly different perspective. We propose that space is bustling with these filaments and we just haven't figured out a way to detect them. Remember, they are super thin, like an electron version of spider silk, which is so fragile that you'd never notice walking through a single strand of it, but the spider web does have the same tensile strength as steel. The electron filaments are also made of the same material as the atoms themselves, which makes detecting them tricky, to say the least. The ins and outs of that are for the last part of the Foundation series, where we're going to talk about the structure and the resonant behavior of the atom in our radial elastic model. Remember to subscribe, like, share, and join us at Discord for discussion. We'll see you next time on the Material World.